what does the word gutsy mean to you? Ooh, guts. Like when I think of a gutsy woman and like how it's resonating in my body, she's like a rebel. She's like, you know, I know that like my family, my friends, they all see me this way, but like, fuck it. I'm just going to like, I'm just going to go all in on me. Like gutsy. It just feels like, a. it feels bold. It feels re- like rebellious in a way of like, fuck the norm and fuck the paradigm. I don't want to be a good girl anymore. Yeah. That's what it feels like to me. You're listening to The Gutsy Podcast, where we talk about all things real, raw, and ridiculous about running a business authentically. Whether you need an inspirational pick-me-up or a swift kick in the mental ass, The Gutsy Podcast is your bi-weekly guide to getting out of your head and back into action. I'm Laura Ora, branding and mindset coach for female entrepreneurs, CEO of Works & Co., and your host on this journey through entrepreneurship. It's time to fuel your gutsy. You're ready to be at your next level of love, success, business, or life. But the reality, yeah, it's not quite matching the vision. But what if today you began to feel that next level before it showed up, before the proof was there? before you could hold it in your hand. To believe it to be so true that you can actually feel the joy, excitement, and fulfillment today, right now here in this moment. Today, we're talking with Melissa Martin, a business and embodiment coach about embodying your next level of success through her framework for personal power. Melissa is the creator of the Boldly Courageous community and host of the Boldly Courageous podcast. She is passionate about helping women step fully into owning their gifts and power in the world as leaders and visionaries. Her mission is to help more women realize the greatness that is already within and to take action towards their big dreams despite fear. She believes that when women own their authentic power and shine their light, they give other women permission to do the same. Before we chat with Melissa today, I want to let you know that there's a couple of ways that you can get even more of this gutsy content that I share with you every week. First, if you like some quick snippets and a little bit of brain scratching, follow me on TikTok. I'm at that Laura Aura. I love to slide just like 60 second videos across the table to help you start thinking differently so you can get out of your own way. The second way is inside my free Facebook community called the Gutsy Collective. Look, if you are looking for like-minded people and you want some people to hold you accountable as you are taking action, the Gutsy Collective is perfect for that. And lastly, if you're looking for a little bit more intimate one-on-one or small group containers, go to lauraora.com and click on the Work With Me tab. I've got some upcoming classes on mindset and business, and I am a complete and total nerd in helping you get some clarity so you know where to focus your efforts connect with your energy, and start doing the shit that you've always wanted to do. Links to all of this magic is in the show notes where you can find everything at lauraora.com. Right now, in this moment, I'm guessing that you're here because you are ready to embody that next level of success. So let's get into today's episode with Melissa. Melissa, welcome to the Gutsy Podcast. Mm, It's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So I was, you know, I was binging some of your content before we were chatting. And I saw on your TikTok that you are an expert necklace untangler. (laughs) Tell me about this. (laughs) I think it's my, my, uh, cap, the Capricorn in me likes challenges. I'm solutions oriented. I love to solve problems and untangling necklaces is just like one of those meditative things where I'm like, it's a challenge, but I'm going to see it through to the end. And the feeling of it being done is so satisfying. And I think that is just such a perfect, uh, like template for who I am as a person. So <laughs> my girlfriends know, like every time I see them, they're like, here you go. <laughs> they just hand me their necklaces. And I'm like, I got you. Don't worry about it. You're like, give me five <laughs> minutes and I've got this. Yes, yeah. Exactly. I feel like untangling necklaces is an art form of its own, right? Like, and I feel like I'm usually good for a few minutes, but then like, you can start like feeling that, like feeling rise up and I'm like, put it down walk away. So mad respect for your incredible skill. <laughs> so many metaphors in that, right? Like so many. What, what a teaching moment. Always. Everything's a teaching moment, isn't it? Yes. 
Yes, and I'm certain I'm certain we're gonna have all kinds of teaching moments today. We're talking about embodying your next level, which I'm so excited to get into. But first, I know that you've had an incredible journey that has led you to where you are. So tell our listeners a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Mm, thank you. Yes, life is full of all kinds of surprises lately. And my entrepreneurial journey happened, I guess you could say by mistake. Of course, it's divinely timed, but I had worked in the financial service industry for about 15 years and was working for a really boutique company that restructured their their business. They're now out of business, but I ended up getting laid off and it put me in a space of extreme financial struggle, a lot of inner turmoil, a lot of reflection on you know my value and my worth. I was living in a very remote area of upstate New York at the time and working for this company was a remote position. So I wasn't able to just go out and replace my income. And I was feeling very challenged, very frustrated because I literally could not get a call back from any of the companies I was applying for, even though I was overqualified. And I was so frustrated. And I'm sure like if you've ever been through the interview process or trying to find a job, especially now in this current market, like it's challenging. And I had seen uh, the spouse of a friend from high school post on social media that she was a fitness entrepreneur and she was hosting a info session for fitness competitions. And it was something that I had always wanted to do. And I thought, I have time. Uh, Why not? You know, go after this goal. I'm a goal oriented person. So I went and um, ended up on that path of competing in bikini competitions and through that process was introduced to the power of network marketing. I started using uh, wellness products and had great results. And this was in 2012, 2013, right? When Instagram was really taking hold in the influencer space and I was posting my meals and, you know, I cringe when I scroll back and look at my Instagram, but I (laughs) love the woman, you know, that and what the messy action that she was taking. And so network marketing became an in the meantime thing for me. It was really meant to be something that I was doing until I found another job, but I had success very quickly. Um, which is not the norm, but I took everything that I had learned from the corporate world and everything that I was learning about digital marketing and put it into play and built a multiple six figure income very quickly. And so I did network marketing for about seven years. I earned well over a million dollars in that space. I had a team of over 5,000 people. I was a top income earner on the trips and speaking on stages and doing all the things. And I love that model so much because it's like entrepreneurship with training wheels. It really taught me how to make things simple and duplicatable. It taught me how to ask better questions. I learned a lot about self-leadership, which is very different than circumstantial leadership and um, built some incredible friendships and had some big heartbreaks in that process. And in 2019, that network marketing company restructured their income plan. And I went from earning a multiple six-figure income to earning a couple hundred dollars a month within 60 days. Wow. So it was another one of those moments where I was like, oh, I've been here before. Life has a habit of repeating itself. So what did I not get this time around? Like what were the lessons that I had to learn? And I decided to go full-time into entrepreneurship at that time, coaching and mentoring, creating digital products, speaking on stages, doing all the things that I had already been doing in network marketing, but as an actual entrepreneur. And that has brought me to some incredible places and spaces in my life. And oddly enough, um, full transparency, I haven't really shared this with anyone. I'm actually uh, stepping back into the corporate world, not because I don't love entrepreneurship. I do. But one of the biggest lessons I learned through getting laid off in the corporate world, building a network marketing, losing that business, and then being a solopreneur is the power of multiple income streams. And I have some really big goals and I have a really powerful network and some really awesome skills. I'm like, why not put this to work and double my income overnight? So that is the path that I'm on right now. I'm not stepping away from entrepreneurship, but I am making a decision that my future self is going to thank me for in a big way, even though the decision to get here was filled with so many questions of like shame and what are people going to think? And are they thinking I'm a failure? And like, what kind of entrepreneur goes back to the corporate world? So I've been walking myself through a lot of that lately. Mm, You know, and I think that's such an incredibly powerful reminder that it doesn't matter what phase, what stage, what part of your journey you're on, there are different 
versions of that mind talk, right? Of the what ifs, of the worry, of the other opinions, like all this stuff. Like I think sometimes people think like, oh, I've, you know, this person's achieved that level of success, so they can't possibly experience. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, if anything, it gets louder sometimes, and I don't know if you experience that as well, but I, I feel like with each new chapter that you unfold comes new opportunities to learn more about yourself. 100%. And I think that you also brought up a really good point too, is like, you know, what, you know, when it showed back up again and you said, and you asked yourself, what lesson didn't I get? What do I need to learn? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Cause I just think that that's so powerful. Yeah. So when I lost my, my job in 2012, the thing that I felt the most shame around was money. And it's been kind of a theme in my life. I was literally just having this conversation yesterday with a girlfriend, again, about feeling shame and guilt around money. And I, when I started building a network marketing, the thing that motivated me the most was making money. And I made a lot of money. I also spent a lot of money. So when I reflect back on that experience, when I when our network marketing company restructured, even though I had made a lot of money, I didn't understand the difference between making money and building wealth. And as a result, I wasn't financially prepared for the unexpected. I had been living beyond my means. And it was really, a lot of it was coming from a place of feeling like, I didn't have control. Like I wanted to be in control all the time. And there's a lot of parallels between, I think the way people view money and being a good steward of that money and the same way that they view maybe diet and exercise. At least that was the same for me of like, if I'm on this super restrictive diet, I will binge, I will, I will go off the deep end. And it's the same thing I was noticing with money is that I was guilting and shaming myself into saving and budgeting and being strict and being the good girl when it comes to my finances. And then I was like, fuck it. I, I don't like, I want to be in control and control to me felt like not having to stick to a specific plan because I wasn't really rooted in the why it was more coming from a place that was driven by you've been a bad girl and, um, shame and guilt, which never gets you the results you want. So I was like, okay, I know how to make money but the lesson I need to learn is what to do with it once I get it and how to build actual wealth and to just think about the future version of myself and the decisions that I can make that my future self will thank me for, not necessarily like the past version of me and how she would have, you know, handled money and, and, and really getting down to that deeper level, because I don't think that it's really about money. It's about what money represents, right? So it's a really powerful amplifier for whatever's under the surface. And so that was kind of the, I was like, oh, I've been here before in multiple six figures of debt, like struggling financially. What did I miss last time? And what are some of the things that I can do to start shifting out of that? Mm, That's amazing. You know, that restrictive mindset, that restrictive um, habits, you know, I mean, it's like a rebellious teenager. Like, don't tell me what to do, <laughs> right? Like 100% you gonna tell yes. me what to do with my money, what I can and can't do. Well, watch me. And even though we're not consciously doing it, our subconscious and our old habits and beliefs and patterns are like, I know how to do this. I've done it yes. plenty of times before. So yes. here we are again. <laughs> yes. It takes an incredible amount of self-awareness, um, to shift these patterns that are this deep. Like I've been able to shift other things, And this is the one that is the most confronting for me because it's the one that's most deeply rooted from a very young age. Absolutely. And, you know, I I also want to just applaud your transparency and your, your boldness to make a career move that could seemingly seem ridiculous to some people, right? Well, why would you do this if you don't that? I mean, we could, we Mm -hmm. could write a book on everyone else's thoughts, but do they actually matter? They only matter if we allow them to, right? Mm. Um, but but seeing and knowing what your future self wants, what your own personal goals are in your life, in your business, in your career, I think that's so liberating to be like, it doesn't matter what other people think. I'm going to do what is right for me. How do you walk, because you're currently in it right now, right? Like, how do you walk yourself through to keep making these bold decisions? This was one of the more challenging decisions for all of those reasons, right? And I I think that 
you know, on one side of the coin, like I could see where my, it was my ego driving the show, right. Of like fear of judgment and what are other people going to say and what's the narrative and what's the story. And so the process that I have to walk, that I walk myself through to kind of navigate that is, is one is just getting really clear and, and just pausing and getting really clear on like what's present here for me and, and not from a place of like judgment, but from a place of curiosity. So I was just noticing where my thoughts were going. I was noticing the stories that I was telling and like all of the limiting beliefs and, and whatnot that were coming up. And so it's, it's kind of like pulling the sheets back or like looking under the bed and being like, okay, what's actually here. It's not a monster, but there might be a lot of like dust bunnies and like a lost sock or something, you know, uh, some snacks, maybe, I don't know. Um, but then from there, it gave me an opportunity to really observe the root of those stories, right? Because in any scenario, they're the facts of whatever it is. Like the fact is like, I had a choice to make. Like the fact is like, I'm an entrepreneur. My income goes up and down pretty drastically. And it's not something that a lot of people really talk about. The facts were that my nervous system was deregulated and I was trying to build a business and sell from a dysregulated nervous system, which doesn't work. So those were the facts. And then there's all the stories that we create about those facts. And the cool thing about that is that uh, you can create any story you want. You can't really change the facts. So I had an opportunity to really look at like, what are all the stories that I'm telling about this potential decision? Or what are all the stories that I'm telling about this current circumstance that I'm in? And if I think about the version of me who is embodied in her personal power and is making decisions from an aligned place, what are the stories that she would be telling? And I'm like, oh, that's different. And so when we can welcome in a new story and we can start to understand, okay, if I choose this story, the version of me that chooses this story acts this way, thinks this way, talks this way, carries herself this way, leads herself this way. And then that provides a framework for embodiment. So we can now start to embody those actions. And it all sounds great until you get to this like embodiment step and you're like, but that means I have to actually take action. Cause all of this stuff is just theoretical. The action taking is the hardest part because it's where you're literally standing on the edge being like, Ooh, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to do it. Right. And then from there really just, um, celebrating those small steps of, you know, the future self and the new story that I'm stepping into honoring the nervous system and forgiveness, a lot of forgiveness of, um, it couldn't have happened any other way. Like it literally could not have happened any other way because every single scenario was lined up perfectly for me to make those decisions in the past. So a lot of forgiveness and a lot of celebrating for, for where I'm going. So I kind of like snuck something in there and this is my framework for embodiment and personal power, which is pause, observe, welcome, embody, release, and rejoice. And it's an acronym for power. So this is the process that I literally walk myself through on a daily basis, whether it's like a trigger that comes up in a relationship or something bigger, like navigating this choice and this career move. Absolutely. I love it. And I'd love to maybe dissect that process even further. Um, Mm -hmm. I could, I could hear it in there, but I think it's, I think it's so powerful, um, pun intended, not intended (laughs) to be able to recognize yourself, right? Like that's the, that's the part that gets skipped over is, um, how how am I actually feeling, uh, having awareness around yourself, like, and then giving yourself permission to make those decisions. It's, it's incredible. Before we dig further into that process, tell me a little bit about what, what is your view? What is your thought on what embodiment is? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And it's different for everybody, right? But in a nutshell, what is embodiment? To me, embodiment is a sense of freedom and inner trust within who we are because our words and our actions align, not only on the outside, but on the inside, right? So embodiment is about personal power, not circumstantial power. 
circumstantial power is I will lead myself when everything outside of me is ideal, right? We all have those days where it's like the perfect temperature and you wake up five minutes before your alarm and like you have the best hair day ever and there's no traffic and like everybody loves your ideas. It's easy to like be in integrity with your word on days like that. But embodiment to me is the actions and the words aligning when the circumstances are not ideal. So if you say, I'm going to meditate every day, then you don't, okay? There might not be anybody around you to hold you to that other than you. You hold yourself to that, to your word. And you're the one that knows when you're out of integrity and you're out of alignment. And that's the hardest realization to come to is that at the core of everything, we are the common denominator to setting standards and and boundaries in our life. So when I think about a woman who is embodied, she is a woman who, when she walks into the room, it's not look at me, it's here I am. Because on the inside, her words and her actions align and are in congruency to herself first before anybody else. So regardless of what the circumstances are, she's still choosing to be a woman of her word. And that word is what truly creates confidence because you know that no matter what, like you are a steward of yourself. So it's kind of um, a long-winded answer, but I've had these more recently. I'm in a relationship now and it's the first time I've been in a relationship since I ended my marriage in the end of 2019. And our commitment coming into the relationship was to be uh, the truest version of ourselves, which sounds great, right? It's like a Hallmark card until you actually do it. (laughs) Until right? you're in the thick of Until it. Until you're in the thick of it. And I've had so many moments where I'm like, okay, this was my intention. Now my, that, that was my word. Now my actions have to fall in line. And I can't tell you how many times I've had those moments. I can feel myself wanting to hide or wanting to be not fully seen or not giving the whole truth or not being fully authentic. And I'm the only one that knows that. And so in that experience, the embodiment of truth is being willing to be seen for the good and the quote unquote bad, right? And no matter what. So I have trust within myself that like, okay, even if it's not received well, I know that I was a woman of my word. And that is the type of woman I choose to embody. Absolutely. So I know that there's a lot of people listening right now and they're like, okay, I I hear that, but how? Mm-hmm. How do I, how do I do that? Where do you even start? Like, yeah, you know, where do it we can... go from here? <laughs> the million dollar it's, question, right? Well, you know what? It's like, um, I use this analogy cause it's such a, I like a, I like visuals. So, you know, when you, um, you probably walk in and out of your closet every day, multiple times a day. And there, perhaps if you're anything like me, there is a little thought that comes in. It's like, I really need to clean this closet out. And then you close the door and you forget it. But every single time you come in, it's like, I need to clean the closet. I need to clean the closet. Right. So on some level, there is an awareness that something is not flowing properly. There's a cog in the wheel. And what happens when we organize our closet, right? it gets way messier before it gets organized. And we start pulling stuff out and we realize like, I didn't even know half the stuff was in here. Some of it doesn't even belong to me. This doesn't fit me anymore. And then you open up a box and then there's more stuff. And it can, and like, you look at the mess and you start to feel really overwhelming and overwhelmed. And it would just be easier to just shove it back in the closet and close the door. Right. But one by one, you take each, each article of clothing or each shoe or jewelry, and you look at it and you decide, does this stay? Does this go right? Is this matching my future or is this holding me in my past? And we make decisions of this comes into my future and this goes into my past. Some of this might not even be ours. Like, Oh, this is something I borrowed from someone doesn't even belong to me. I can give it back. Right? So this is, I'm speaking very much metaphorically. And when we start to do this type of work of embodiment and personal power, it's very much the same thing. And it can feel really messy before it starts to feel more in flow. And so I always invite people in to pick one thing that is the area that you want to focus on, because trying to blow up your entire life all at once can be challenging. 
a little be bit. Kind, <laughs> be kind, you know, to your nervous system. So this framework is something that I use every, like on a daily basis on small things and then also big things, right? And so for the big things, I always encourage people to just, what is like the one thing right now that is really on a deep level causing you the most unrest? It could be a relationship. It could be um, your, your, your circle, your community. It could be your career. It could be your money. It could be anything, right? It could just be your, the way that you view your body and picking that one thing and really being committed to doing the work and getting curious about what is here. And again, it's like really pause and bring presence to the thoughts that are playing in our mind over and over again, or the way in which these things are um, cultivating in your life. Right. So if it's your girlfriends, for example, or your friendships, taking inventory of each friendship and looking at what is the story that I've created around each one of these friendships. Right. Right. So we just have to get present to what's here. And then the observation piece for me is really about going back to the beginning. When was the very first time this story was created? I had a lot of sisterhood wounds that I had to work through. And when I went through this process and I kind of like timelined my life out, the very first memory that I had around this archetype that I had created in my life around needing to prove myself in female relationships, but also not allowing myself to be big. Like I wanted to prove that I could be good and supportive to women in my life, but that meant not being big myself was, um, in elementary school on the playground, there was these girls that I wanted to be really good friends with. And I asked them if we could be friends and they were like, yeah, sure. We're fast runners. Like you have to complete this obstacle course in a certain amount of time. And then you can be our friend, right? You probably can tell where this is going. And I ran my little heart out and I wasn't fast enough. So I wasn't allowed to be their friend. And so in that moment, I formed this belief, right? So oftentimes our um, coping strategies or our templated ways of being come from a story or an experience that happened to us at a young age. So when we observe that story and we can go back again, we can separate the facts from the story that we created. And the good thing is we can pick a new story. So I could have created 15 different stories that could like from that one experience, but there was just one that imprinted on me at that time. So when I talk about doing the work, this is what I'm saying. It's like a lot of being present with ourselves, which is meditation and one pointed attention and like getting off of our devices and really being here with people. The observation part is a lot of journaling. It's a lot of reflection, maybe even asking your family about, Hey, this one thing that happened, like what was your experience? Right. And then the welcoming in a new story is the part where we get to create the new future for who we are. Um, there's always the past version of us. That's typically the one driving the bus. But there's also a future version of us that if we are really present when we're making decisions, we can kind of pause for a second and ask ourselves, like, am I making this choice based on who I was or am I making this choice based on who I desire to be? So the woman that I desire to be in my relationship is someone who is fully authentic. So I have to meet myself in those experiences and be like, oh, fuck, like, This doesn't feel good, but I'm going to be authentic because that's my commitment, right? So you can kind of see the layers to this, right? And the embodiment piece is something that is really about taking all of that, the pause, observe, and the welcome, and putting it into action in small steps. So it could be something as simple as sleeping with your phone in the kitchen instead of by your bed so that you don't wake up and scroll social media in the morning because the woman that you choose that you desire to become honors her energy first before anybody else. So she wakes up, she stretches, she drinks water, she brushes her teeth, like she prays, meditates, whatever before getting on the phone. Right. So it could be something as small as, as that, as an embodiment practice. And then the forgiveness part is just a lot of like release journaling. I like to burn things. I'm cathartic, you know? Like oh yeah. The absolute, I'm hundred percent with you. <laughs> <laughs> and celebration, like celebrating the fact that like one week straight, I've managed to sleep with my phone in the other room. Like that's worth celebrating. Melissa is so right. Like even the smallest of wins are worth celebrating. 
So I ask you today, when is the last time that you have celebrated something that you have done, accomplished, or followed through on? Celebrating your wins is one of the things that we love to do inside the Gutsy Collective, which is my free Facebook community. And if you're looking for accountability, but also some people that like truly get your wins with you, no matter how small or large they are, and you're hungry for that togetherness, then I invite you to join the Gutsy Collective. You can go to Facebook and just type that in or scroll down and click on the Gutsy Collective in the show notes. Melissa has some more beautiful guidance to share with you. So let's get into the second half of today's episode. Absolutely. Gosh, thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's, it's really helpful to just like see it and hear it in action. Right. Because I think that sometimes when we think about doing the work, we think about like shifting this whole big thing and how there's these big steps and how are we going to do that? And it's like literally something as small as choosing where to leave, to charge your phone at night. It, that's a big step towards your next phase, right? That's, that's helping you to embody the next level of your life, of your career, of your, you know, relationships, whatever it is that you're working on and towards it's really in those little small moments that add up to those big changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I think sometimes we feel like it has to be this big grand thing and sometimes it is, but becoming the woman who leads herself through anything starts at leading yourself through the smallest micro shifts in becoming the woman of your word. Right. So I think a lot of times when people set these big goals, the reason why they fail is because they don't know how to, they don't know how to course correct when there's a circumstance that's out of their control that throws them out of their flow. Right. Mm. Again, it's easy to sleep with your phone in the other room when you don't have circumstances that are challenging you. Right. It's easy to set boundaries when you don't have anybody testing them, but that's not what boundaries are for. Boundaries are meant to be tested. I kid you not. The moment I set a boundary in my life, someone will come (laughs) and try and knock it down. And I'm like, fuck, (laughs) why? (laughs) Oh, I get it. Right. It's like strength is built with resistance. So, right. Absolutely. So, so how, what are, what do you suggest then in those moments when you are being challenged, when it is like, okay, I said, I want this, but now, you know, this whole other thing is presenting itself. How do you course correct in those small moments? to help get yourself back into embodiment? You know, sometimes you don't, sometimes you make the mistake and that's where the forgiveness piece comes in of like, this is not always an easy process. It's like, imagine someone, imagine you've lived in a house for 20 years and for 20 years, every day you've woken up and gone to the same cabinet to get the same coffee cup, to go over to this side of the kitchen, to make the, the, and the coffee makers in the same place. Right. And you've done this for 20 years. And then I come in and rearrange your whole kitchen. It's going to take you some time to like create a new neural pathway in your brain to not even have to think about where the coffee is anymore. It's going to take a lot more energy and presence for you to figure out where the cups are now and rewire to this new pattern. So you're going to make mistakes. Like it's inevitable, but I like I always think of this in terms of fitness because it's such a big part of, of my background. It's not really how many times you start over. It's how you start when you start over, right? So if you make a mistake and let's say, you know, you're working so hard on, on something in your life that you want to shift and you find yourself repeating the same pattern over and over again, you can get really frustrated and quit and judge and guilt and shame yourself, right? Or you can meet each new opportunity with a level of excitement and curiosity and grace that, Hey, I'm learning something new. It's like a baby falling down when they learn how to walk, they get back up. Right. But the, the most important component of all of this is presence is just that split second pause before you react to something and allowing yourself to sit and then respond. So a really great sort of example for this is uh, as a recovering people pleaser, saying yes to every single thing that anyone asks of you. 
And something that I noticed the way that resistance shows up for me when I have like a big goal or a big dream or whatever, I'll just say yes to everything so that I'm energetically exhausted and not available to do the big thing. So resistance for me will show up as like manifesting some, some drama in my life that like pulls me out of alignment or getting involved in somebody else's drama or uh, like deciding on that day that I'm going to rearrange my closet. Right. And, and then I'm too <laughs> tired by the end of the day to actually do the thing that I need to do. So being able to have that presence and recognizing that as a people pleaser, you just say yes to everything you're respond or you're reacting to your environment. That's circumstantial. You ask for my help. I say, yes, you need me. I'm there. This happens like crisis mode. Let me get involved. Let me fix it. That is very much a react energy. And that is very much a, I'm giving it's leaky. I'm just giving my energy away. But when we can pause and kind of like pull that energy back, I always like to give a 24 hour window for me to make sure that my yes is a holy hell. Yes. Now I'm responding from personal power because I've given myself the power of the pause to say, okay, if I say yes to this, what am I giving up on the other end? How does this impact my goals? How does this impact my commitments, my relationships? What is, what are the pro like, I can really look at it. Like from a body perspective, it might feel like a yes, but sometimes the body and the mind aren't always on the same page, right? We got to give ourselves time to calibrate. Yes. Yes. So all, all that to say, number one, give yourself grace. You're going to make mistakes. Number two is even if it's a 30 second pause, give yourself an opportunity to just pause for 30 seconds so that your body and your brain can connect and you can respond from a place of personal power versus reacting to everything that's coming at you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Look, I think the pause is so grossly underrated right? Yeah. Like that, it literally just gives you a chance to, it's like everything can connect for a second. And you're not like 20 steps ahead of yourself in your brain. You're not lagging 20 steps behind you in your body, right? Like when you're in that moment and you feel the pressure and like, Oh, I need to do that. Like you're like everywhere, right? Like yes. you can even feel the energy is just like scattered. Like we've just thrown it all up against the wall. And the pause is like, hold on a second. Let me, let me get my stuff right? And you pull all the parts back to you. And then you're like, now I can logically think yes, or, like or now I can spiritually feel right. Like I can, I'm actually connected and I'm doing what I need to do. Sometimes it's looking at your calendar. Sometimes it's checking in with yourself emotionally. Sometimes it's checking in with the people around you, your commitment level. I mean, all the things It just like, and to your point, like you could literally do this in 30 seconds, but if you're not consciously aware of like just how many times you're just throwing your power out the window, it, it's why the, the kind of rat race continues. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is everything I believe rises and falls on radical self-awareness. And you cannot have radical self-awareness if you're not giving yourself that moment to take a breath and just like, and like be present. And that's why meditation is so helpful. Breath work is so helpful. One pointed attention. Like we live in a world where we're so distracted by a million things. And I think that's by design because it disconnects us from our power, but the most powerful place you can be is here, all your energy focused in on one thing. And now you can operate from a place of true discernment. And if you are a people pleaser, this is probably the most important practice you can have is to pause because your gut reaction is always to, if I say no to this, right? Like I will lose love and I won't be safe and I'll be kicked out of the community, which is not true. These are all stories, right? So the power of the pause has really been the most life-changing thing for me when it comes to embodiment and personal power, um, because it's the first step to being in your power yeah. is like slowing the energetic flow down for a second and being like, well, I'm not going to react. I'm going to respond. I don't know about you too, but I found that the power of the pause also helps me to, um, shut up for a second and, <laughs> and not get myself in trouble. Right. Like, especially if there's, uh, you know, a challenging conversation happening or a relationship that's, there is a moment of contention or, you know, there's something's happening with a client or like, 
any form of communication, right? That pause to just like, let me feel into this and recalibrate that it comes with a whole lot of a whole lot less of like, I'm sorry, I screwed up. Right. Like, and, and that's okay. Right. We're humans that happens, but I've just found that like, it really helps me to communicate in my highest self versus just speaking out of direct emotion. Absolutely. And I, I think the place that this obviously gives us the, op- the greatest opportunity is in relationships. Right. Yeah. And there have been many moments. And th- again, I, I want to preface this by saying like, this has been years of work for me. Like this isn't new. Right. But there have been many moments in my relationship where I have felt very triggered and I know myself when emotions are high, intelligence is low. And for me, something that is a really core value of mine is clear and respectful communication because I've had the opposite. I grew up in a very dysregulated household where communication was unsafe. And so in relationships, that's been something I've had to work through. And so there's been many moments in my relationship where I would say, I have like, I don't like, maybe there's a conversation that I want to have, or I'm feeling some kind of way and I want to talk about it, but I'm not ready. Like I want to have this conversation, but I'm not ready right now. And I will take the time that I need to go regulate my nervous system. So that could be, um, calling a friend who has a relationship that I value, like that has the relationship I want, right. That can give me honest feedback, moving my body, journaling, meditating, crying, like doing what I need to do to move the emotion so that the God or spirit or source or whatever can work through me to, so that I can find clarity so that when it comes time to communicate, I'm not communicating from a place of mumble jumble. I'm not, I'm not still processing. I'm, cl- I'm now clear. And I can come back to that person and say, here's how I'm feeling. Here's where I feel challenged. Here's how I could use your support. Here are my questions. Like, here's my intention versus like screaming and yelling and like projecting, which you can do in a, in a safe space without that person present. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I I'm not still processing. I think that's, that's a key thing, right? When, when, when you're still processing, calibrating, feeling, going through it, Mm -hmm. that pause just gives you the chance to feel what you need to feel. And eventually it all, the dust settles. Yes. Right. And that's then the place where we can move forward and, and have the conversation. I'd love to know how, how does one figure out what their version of embodiment is? Cause someone might be listening and being like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm interested in this and, and I'm, yeah. and I'm, I'm hearing and feeling it, but how, do, how do I know what my embodiment is? I think it changes person to person and, you know, we are dynamic beings. There is no there. <laughs> um, But what has helped me the most when it comes to figuring out what my version of embodiment is, has been discerning between my past, my current and my future self. So I do a lot of time. uh, I spend a lot of time rather in meditation, connecting with that version of me who is living a life of alignment that is living a life of personal power that is living from a place of joy and overflow and abundance. So when I think about my highest self, or I think about the version of me who has experienced success, that's what that feels like. You know, success to me, isn't necessarily a physical thing like a house or a car or money, but it's more a a, a physical feeling in the body of peace and calm and joy and happiness and, um, fulfillment and also, um, empowerment and choice, right? I don't feel those things all the time, but there are definitely, it's, it's interesting. Like I've had some of these conversations lately where I'm like on paper, my life should look like an absolute shit show, but I feel so much happiness and joy and peace and trust that it's working in the way that it should be because there's oftentimes a lag between, um, the physical manifestation, you know, and the embodiment practice. So oftentimes we are being the thing before the thing shows up, if that makes sense. Uh And, and we have to learn how to be in the moment between manifestations because there's a growth 
that happens. So I spend a lot of time uh, in visualizations, feeling into the feeling of the future version of me, how she feels, um, what she's saying to me, how she's guiding me. It's kind of like your higher self. Um, and I, I practice feeling it before doing it. I think that where I've gotten it wrong and I know a lot of other people have is I'm an action taker and I've always been taught if you don't like something, change it. Okay. Well, I don't like this relationship. So I'm going to dump this guy. I'm going to go date someone new. No problem. I don't like where I live. I'll move. I don't like my job. I'll get a new one. I don't like my hair. I'll cut it. Right. So we've been sold this idea that if we take new action, we'll get a different result which in theory is true until it's not true anymore because we're missing a fundamental piece of the puzzle, which is that everything that's driving our actions is driving our actions. And it's the beliefs that lay the foundation for our thoughts that then create the action for us to get the result. So if the new action is dump the guy, get a new one, but the belief is I'm not worthy of mind blowing love. Um, If the belief is I have to pretend to be someone I'm not in order to get love, then we will continue to take actions and choose partners that make that belief true. So I think it's really important that we get accustomed to what it feels like in our body to be that person, because this whole concept of like fake it till you make it doesn't really work in my opinion. I know for some that might not be true. So embodiment is going to look different for every single person. And the only way you'll know is um, when you are faced with a challenge and you operate from where you want to go versus where you've been. And you can feel that feeling in your body. Mm, Absolutely. And, And it's a, it's a space of peace. I think, you know, of stillness of like, it just feels good right? You know, just like you want to talk about like pure stillness of joy, like making embodied decisions aren't always easy, right? Especially if other things and people are involved, but it's not, it's not just like this magical path where like everything is just perfect. But when you feel solid in your decisions, when you, when you've truly shifted through one of those beliefs and chosen a different response, when you have giving yourself permission to pause, like that inner peace really starts to grow, right? Like I just picture this cup, just like completely filling up. And it's like, that's, that's the fucking goodness, right? It's so juicy. And I, I want to just anchor this with really understanding the difference between potential and reality, because I've made this mistake a lot in business, I've made it a lot in relationships is focusing so much on potential. And I think it's important that we do think about potential and we do think about the future and all the possibilities and everything that's coming. Right. And being grateful that it's coming like future gratitude is the thing, like it's everything it's science, but there's a big difference between living in potential and living in reality. And there's, there's a danger to living in potential and ignoring reality. And this happened to me a lot in relationships, romantic partnerships, is that I would see the potential in someone and it would allow me to override my, my intuition about all the red flags that were here now, because I was just building this like fictitious relationship or this fictitious reality. And that's what drove me. And as a result, the reality was less than pleasurable. It was less than desirable. It was less than perfect. And it was actually not great at all. And that's a form of bypassing. Mm. So I set out this intention. It was more specifically in my romantic relationships and my partnership that, but it's manifested in every area of my life. And the intention was that I want my reality to be so fucking mind-blowingly good that I can't even fathom how amazing the potential is. 
Mm. And when you set that intention that I want my reality, my desires for my reality to be so fucking mind blowing that I can't even fathom how good the potential can be. You immediately raise the bar in your life. You immediately raise the standard in your life. You immediately set the, your like standard of what you will or will not accept. And again, the embodiment of that is I set the standard. I am the one that's responsible for like policing that standard, which is not always easy. But what that does is that allows you to be so present in the moment and like just the juiciness of life, even like your, your financial situation could be a mess. Your living situation could be a mess, but you could be still so lit up by what is here right now, because you've set the intention that the reality gets to be so good that eventually you can't help, but bring the outer and the inner to align, right? Eventually those two things will become a reality. So if you're on that path and it feels like you're doing the work you have to like, there, there, sometimes there is a gap between like the physical feeling of like, I feel so happy and impo- and happy and like joyful. And like my reality is so mind blowing before it starts to like actually show up in the outside. <laughs> so, and that's, that's, I think that's what it boils down to is mm-hmm. trusting and believing that in those moments that I can, I can be present in the current now while also feeling the joy of what I am calling in at the same time. And it's, it's, it's that stretch. I call it the hallway, right? Yes, like you, you've, 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 you've walked through one door, right? You, you maybe even halfway down, who knows how long that hallway is, right? We can't see yeah. the other end, Yeah. but our choices are, do you, do we turn around and go back out the door we just came through? No. Or are we going to trust that that door is on the other side and we're going to keep going? Mm. And, and that's, that's the work, right? Like that's what all of this is all about is continuing forward while also being insanely grateful for the things that you're currently in right now, because at one point, this was one of your hallways, yeah. right? <laughs> so true. Amazing. Ugh. I feel like we could have hours of conversation, my friend. I feel like we are a sister from another mister. Totally. Um, I want to make sure that everyone knows where to get in touch with you, how to connect with you. So give us the goods. Where can we find yes. you? Instagram is my favorite place to hang out. I'm at the Melissa Martin. I'm at the Melissa Martin on all the things. Um, so you can find me there. And then, um, as a gift, I will share with your listeners. We can put it, um, in the show notes. I have the, uh, future self guided visualization. So if you're wondering how to tap in with that version of you, um, I'd love to, to share that as a gift. Absolutely. Um, it's been one of my favorite things to just help me, you know, get in touch with that, that version of me. Um, so you can connect with me there as well. Amazing. Melissa, I would love to know what does the word gutsy mean to you? Ooh, guts. Like when I think of a gutsy woman and like how it's resonating in my body, she's like a rebel. She's like, you know, I know that like, you know, my family, my friends, they all see me this way, but like, fuck it. I'm just going to like, I'm just going to go all in on me. Like gutsy. It just feels like, a. it feels bold. It feels like rebellious in a way of like, fuck the norm and fuck the paradigm. I don't want to be a good girl anymore. Yeah. That's what it feels like to me. I I'm a thousand percent on board with that. My friend, (laughs) fuck the norm. (laughs) Amazing. Melissa, thank you so much for your time and your energy today. This has been a beautiful conversation and a beautiful space that I know is going to, to light a fire under at least one, but I'm sure many listeners today. So thank you. Mm, My pleasure. It's been an honor. You know, I made a TikTok video a couple of weeks ago about the word fearless and how this word, this phrase, this mentality has been marketed and shoved down your throat, making you believe that you must do something and be fearless while you're doing it. When in reality, it's about evaluating that fear, consciously choosing if this is something to move forward with and then trusting yourself to move forward even when fear is present. And that, my friends, is why this Thursday's Power Back episode is called Fuck Being Fearless. I want you to know and understand that it is okay to be nervous and worried and have fear present and, and still be able to move forward on your success path. This has got your wheels turning. Come back for this Thursday's Power Back where we're gonna talk about moving forward even when fear is present. 
Until then, come get social with me, connect with me on TikTok, Facebook, or Instagram. You can find me using at that Laura Aura. And as always, until I see you next time, stay gutsy.